Good evening, everybody. It is certainly a pleasure to be with each and every one of you. You know, Midway is one of my favorite congregations to come and be a guest speaker at. And, and contrary to what the Jameses may have told you, it's not only because there is a Whataburger between my house and here. But, you know, that's just a perk. Anyway, uh, I remember when I was talking to David about this and he, he uh, so graciously invited me to come over, one of the things that he said that, that y'all's theme was was going to be on refreshing, and I thought, well, there's nothing that is more refreshing spiritually than the concept of rest, and that's the reason that I wanted to go ahead and get us started tonight with the idea of resting with God, and I think that this, this is important because the way that we have set up our minds, some of the ideas and the preconceptions we have about rest in our modern society, I think in many ways is incorrect and inconsistent with the way that the Bible would describe this concept of rest. And, and part of the idea that I have behind this comes from my study not only of the scripture itself, but from a leadership book uh, called The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. Now, some of you probably heard about this, some of you may have not, but those of you that are less familiar with it, a man named Stephen Covey wound up writing a book that discussed the seven habits that made him a successful person. And the goal of this book was to try to help other people become more successful in their professional and personal lives by developing these habits and following them. And one thing that was very interesting when I started researching a little bit more about Stephen Covey is that he's actually a very religious person and a lot of the ideas and the principles that he worked into the seven habits came directly from Scripture, and I think that perhaps the one that draws the most from Scripture is habit number seven, because after he's gone through these six habits, these six uh, things that professional people and successful people, both personally and professionally, tend to engage in, he said that there is another step after all that, and that is this idea of sharpening the salt. So what Stephen Covey described in sharpening the salt is that he wanted certain things to be enhanced. That you have these six things that you're very diligent, you work hard, you're very conscientious. We could go through all the other six habits, but that's really a subject for another time. But the interesting thing about habit seven is it focuses primarily on rest. Now you would think in a book that is primarily prescribed for people that are interested in making a success out of themselves, working really hard, that it would be seven habits about work. But this seventh one is about rest. It's about what you do with your downtime, what you do when you're not working. And one of the interesting things that he did with titling it Sharpening the Saw, he didn't want people to get the wrong idea. Going back to what we started out with, he believed, as I do, that unfortunately an awful lot of people have an incorrect view of what rest is. So in his mind, rest should be refreshing. Rest should be something that we take some time off to recharge our batteries, but it should also be strategic. One of the examples that he uses, and this one works very well in the state of Alabama because you can relate almost anything to sports. Uh, one of the things that he uses is a coach watching the game tape. So if you're a coach, whether it's football, baseball, doesn't really matter the sport. Sometimes you take some downtime, you're not training, you're not working with your students, you're not coaching them to be better, but what you're doing is you're taking some downtime and watching some of your previous games. And so what this does and the idea that he's trying to instill in people is even when you're taking a break, you're still doing some self-reflection. You're still taking an honest look at yourself saying, okay, these are some, some of the things that I did right, Maybe these are some areas that we need to improve on. And see, then when the coach actually is working, whether it's at practice, working with his team, or it's in a situation in the next game that he's got coming up, he is better prepared to be able to do the thing that he needs to do, which is, of course, in his particular case, his goal is to win games. And so there's a similar concept that Covey talks about here, and I think as Christians this is something that we can apply to our lives, is that when we want to engage in this idea of rest, it should be refreshing, but it should also be strategic. Now, we're going to delve a little bit deeper into this a little bit later, but God understands that we are human beings and that we do need rest. 
That makes sense to us because God created us in such a way that we have to rest. Think about this. God could have made us any way that he wanted to. He could have made us to where we didn't need sleep. He could have created creatures that never feel fatigue and exhaustion. He could have done that if he wanted to. And yet he didn't. Even before the fall of man, even in the Garden of Eden, there's no indication that Adam and Eve didn't also rest. They had jobs. Adam had to take care of his wife, tend the garden. He was in charge of taking care of the animals. But rest was still a part of it. And so ingrained in us, in our very creation, is this idea that we as human beings are going to need to take time to rest. And being flawed human beings, people that make mistakes, an important part of that rest is going to be to do what Covey recommends and also what we're going to see from God's Word, that we take a second to do some self-reflection, to really dive deep into our soul and see, okay, what are some of the things that I'm doing right? What are some of the things that I need to improve on? And how can I better prepare myself in this period of rest for the next time that I'm going to have to do something, whether it's teaching a Bible class or doing evangelism, whatever your service looks like. Part of our rest should be strategic in that we're taking a look at what we, we need to be doing better in the future. And part of this idea of rest is that it's goal-oriented. Now, we've already touched on this just a little bit. But part of this idea of being able to rest is that even when we're resting, our goal is still on our mind. Now we're taking a break, we're taking a breather, we're not pushing ourselves nearly as hard as we normally would when we're either in practice, performing, whatever it may be. But the point is, even when we are taking a rest, our goal is still a part of that. We are still thinking about the things that we want to accomplish, whether it's becoming a better evangelist, whether it's being, uh, being a better servant to the church, a better servant to our brothers and sisters in Christ, whatever it may be, our goals are still on our mind. And so this refreshing period is done in such a way that we are always working toward that end. And another thing that we need to be aware of is we need to know when to recharge and when to work. This is something that unfortunately many of us have a hard time balancing. Sometimes we work ourselves to death and then we don't have that rest. And then our work gets sloppy. Our work is not really at the level that it needs to be. We may make some mistakes that we wouldn't have made if we had taken some time to, to take a step back and really look at our performance and look at what we did, do some self-evaluation. And then sometimes we have the opposite problem. Sometimes we take a lot more rest than we really need. I know that I'm guilty of this. Sometimes I get lazy. Sometimes there are things I know I ought to be doing. But I convince myself, and this is easy to do and justify in your own mind, that, no, I need a little bit more rest. We find that David had this problem. You remember that right before he committed the great sin with Bathsheba, what was he doing? He was home longer than he was supposed to. The Bible tells us specifically that he was supposed to have already gone back to the battlefield, but he didn't. And so not only is resting too much not productive because we're resting when we could be doing what we need to be doing, but it's also dangerous in the sense that too much rest can leave us with too much time on our hands, and idle hands can be a devil's workshop. Now, that may not be a scripture, but it is true. And that is something that the scripture does tell us over and over again, David being a chief example of that. And then Covey really did base this idea of sharpening the saw on biblical principles. And the way that we can really know that, the way that we can understand that is we look that rest is a theme all throughout the scripture. This may be something that we don't think about. You probably don't hear an awful lot of sermons on this, but the truth is that rest is something that is a part of God's plan. It is a part of God's word and his ideas for us. So to, to point this out, let's go ahead and look at Exodus 31, 13 through 15, where it says, But as for you, speak to the sons of Israel, saying, You shall surely observe my Sabbaths, for this is a sign between me and you throughout your generations that you may know that I am the Lord who sanctifies you. Therefore, you are to observe the Sabbath, for it is holy to you. Everyone who profanes it shall surely be put to death. For whoever does any work on it, that person shall be cut off from among his people. For six days work may be done, but on the seventh day 
there is a Sabbath of complete rest, holy to the Lord. Whoever does any work on this Sabbath day shall surely be put to death. So here we have in the law of Moses, when God has given his law to people, and I want you to think about the significance of this. The Sabbath, the day of rest, is not just a part of the Torah. It is one of the Ten Commandments. So this is obviously something that God thought was important enough not only to include in his law, but make one of the ten big pillars of the law of Moses. This is not something that is just sort of a suggestion from God. Under the law of Moses, this was a command. And we see his rationale for it explained a little bit in more detail here in Exodus 31. That this was a sign from God to his people. His people resting was actually part of the covenant. And so we can see that God does actually put quite a bit of emphasis on rest. And it's important for us to know, and that this is repeated oftentimes in both Deuteronomy and Leviticus, that the reason for the Sabbath, the reason that God implemented that as part of His law, is why? Because God Himself rested. After God had labored for six days, on the seventh day, God took a rest, and then we are supposed to follow his example according to the, the law of Moses. Of course, we're not under the old law anymore, but this was a law for the Israelites. That they were supposed to follow God's example that after six days of laboring, they were supposed to take one day of rest. Now, why did God rest? He's all-powerful, so he obviously wasn't tired. I mean, he could have created the cosmos as often as he wanted to in as little time as he wanted to. And yet, he labored for these six days and still took a day, a seventh day, to look over what he had observed. And what does the scripture tell us from the book of Genesis? That he took that time and looked over it, looked at what he had done, and observed that it was good. So even God, a perfect, all-powerful being, took a day of rest to do some self-reflection, some self-evaluation, and to look at what he had done. If God decides that it is important for him to do that, don't you think it needs to be important to us? Aren't we supposed to be following his example and being as godlike as possible? So would it not stand to reason that we also, if an all-powerful being needs rest, even though he can't exhaust himself, then surely we as fallible human beings with limits certainly need to occasionally take a rest and understand that. And this was such an important part of it that God wanted that day of rest to be sanctified. He says specifically in this passage that it is holy. So the Sabbath day is not just a ritual that, that God gave man because he knew that men were going to tire out and needed a day off. It was a time of sanctification. It wasn't just a break. It was specifically a break to refocus their life on God. It's important for us to note that in their society, very, very different than ours, this was a predominantly agrarian society where the vast majority of the population spent seven days just figuring out how to feed themselves. I mean, good or bad, that's the way that the world was back then. And so God looked at this and implemented a Sabbath saying that, yes, you spend six days trying to labor and take care of yourself, take care of your family, that's all well and good. He says right there, there are six days where work is permitted to be done but the seventh day is mine. The seventh day, you take a rest from your labors, you take yourself out of the world, and you refocus yourself and recenter yourself spiritually on what I am telling you to do, on the life that I am telling you to live. And so we can really very easily see how our rest is also supposed to be strategic. God's plan for rest, of course, includes taking a break, being able to recharge and not wear ourselves out, but an important aspect of that that we do not need to forget is that God is supposed to be a big part of that. That when we do take a break, when we do recharge, that that's supposed to be God-centered as well. To the point to where God threatened to punish those who refuse to observe His Sabbaths. And this is something that Jesus also implemented. This is something that Christ talked about quite a bit. You'll recall that Christ had quite a few spats with the Pharisees over the Sabbath. And this is one of those things that we can really sort of define something and 
fine-tune our idea of what the Sabbath was supposed to be sometimes by looking at what, what it was not intended to be. And, and there's a story here with Christ and the Pharisees that is going to help us with that in Luke 6, 1 through 5, where it says, Now it happened that he was passing through some grain fields on the Sabbath, and his disciples were picking at the heads of grain, rubbing them in their hands, and eating the grain. But some of the Pharisees said, Why do you do what is not lawful on the Sabbath? And Jesus answered them and said, Have you not even read what David uh, did when he was hungry? He and those who were with him, how he entered the house of God and took and ate the consecrated bread, which is not lawful for any to eat except the priest alone, and gave it to his companions. And he was saying to them, The Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. So, real quick, we're going to kind of take this passage in reverse. That last little bit in verse 5, tells us that Jesus is the Lord of the Sabbath. And we know that the Sabbath is the day of rest, the day that the Jews took time out of their day to worship and focus on God. So Jesus, among his many other titles, it could just as easily be translated there, Jesus is the Lord of rest. So there is something significant there that a title that Christ even used to refer to himself was that he is a Lord of rest. And considering the, the hope of an eternal home in heaven with God, this shouldn't be something that's surprising to us, that this is something that is ingrained as a part of Christ's personality and who he, he really is. But I want you to take a look at what we were uh, at the, the overarching theme of this. That his disciples, because they were hungry, were passing through fields of grain, scooping their hands down and rubbing the grain in their hands, to be able to kind of snack on the, the grain because they were hungry at the time. And this is what the Pharisees deemed work. They were literally just plucking heads up as they were walking along, rubbing it in their hands, and snacking. See, this is something that the Sabbath was never intended to be. The Pharisees would rather a man go hungry than to just merely reach down and pick up food to feed himself. This to them qualified as work on the Sabbath. And so Jesus is trying to instill in them this idea that the Sabbath is a gift. It's not something that's supposed to be an anchor around your neck. The Sabbath was something that was given to man by God. And it was something to be done for his enjoyment. It was something that was to be done for his, as we're talking about tonight, refreshment. It was something to make him better and to draw him closer to God. And if there's one theme in the scripture that Jesus really understood, it's that you have to be able to take care of a person's physical needs sometimes to help them really focus on their spiritual needs. This is part of the reason that he healed people. This is part of the reason that he fed people. He wanted to be able to take care of their physical needs to be able to really focus on their spiritual needs. And sometimes rest is a part of that physical need. Sometimes we need rest so that we can be able to focus fully on God. This was a concept that Christ understood. And because his disciples were hungry, he understood that having something in their belly was going to be something that helped them focus spiritually and to do the work that God had given them to do. And so this is why this was very important to Christ that you don't use the Sabbath, you don't use the rules of the Sabbath in this idea that we need to take a rest as an excuse to deprive people. So we see a, just a few verses down in verses 16 through 11 of this same chapter, another incident of Christ having a, a feud with the Jewish elders on the Sabbath. On another Sabbath, he entered the synagogue and was teaching and there was a man whose right hand was withered. The scribes and the Pharisees were watching him closely to see if he healed on the Sabbath, so that they might find reason to accuse him. But he knew what they were thinking, and he said to the man with the withered hand, Get up and come forward. And he got up and came forward. And Jesus said to them, I ask you, is it lawful to do good or to do harm on the Sabbath, to save a life or to destroy it? After looking around them all, he said to them, Stretch out your hand. And he did so, and his hand was restored. 
But they themselves were filled with rage and discussed together what they might do to Jesus. So in this particular story, there is a man that has an ailment, comes to Jesus asking for healing, and the first thought in the Pharisee's mind is, oh, we can use this against Christ. We're going to get him this time. That was really what they were focused on? That they were going to try to use Jesus healing a man, coming to him for help, a man that was in pain, and use that as a cause to go after Christ. There is an unfortunately profound mistake, a profound flaw in their priorities, if that's what they're looking at. And Christ here accurately corrects them and shows them where in their thinking they went wrong. Is it good that the Pharisees wanted to uphold the Sabbath? Absolutely. Is it good that the Pharisees wanted people to focus on the law and focus on God and to get away from the world? Sure. But do you see the irony in what just happened there? They're so focused on making sure that everybody's resting that they're keeping God's work from being done on the Sabbath. That they are making sure that this good work of God being done, they're seeing a miracle take place, and the only thought in their head is, oh, we've got them this time. You see, I think that really a big takeaway that we can look at this story and sort of apply to our own lives is that we have to keep our priorities in order while we're resting. Rest is a great thing. We've spent the entirety of the, the talk tonight focused on rest. But we also have to be cautious not to allow our rest, allow our, I think, completely legitimate desire to have some rest and to recharge our batteries and to look at what we need to be doing. We can't allow that to cause us to ignore people that are in need to ignore doing God's work. You know, I watched a, an interview not too long ago with a guy who is a psychiatrist. He recently wrote a book. And this book become, became a number one seller. In the back of the book, he put his cell phone number. And the guy that was doing the interview is like, I can't believe you put your real cell phone number in a book that sold thousands and thousands of copies. He's like, do you get a lot of calls? He's like, oh, all the time. I'm constantly interrupted. And he said, well, isn't that a, a bother? And he says, Jesus lived his life constantly interrupted. Isn't that true? How many stories start with Jesus trying to do something and then somebody comes up to him asking for help? And I think this is something that we need to be aware of. There's a great quote in a book by C.S. Lewis in the Screwtape Letters where he's speaking as a demon and he's saying that the demons... One of their goals is to make every person believe that they are the rightful owner of 24 hours a day. And that any time that is taken out of that, either by God or by somebody else, they are being robbed of something that is rightfully theirs. God owns all the time. Every second of our life should be God's. And once we start looking at it that way, then when we do have these interruptions, these people coming up to us asking for help, I think we'll be a lot more apt to recognize that, well, that time belongs to God anyway. Any time I have to myself is a gift. And if I take too much of it, then I'm taking away from God what is rightfully His. And if the Pharisees in this story had been doing that from the very beginning, maybe they would have had the right idea there. Maybe they would have seen, okay, well, Christ here is, is being interrupted by somebody and is being called to do something good on the Sabbath and would have celebrated with him and this man watching this miracle take place. One last story of, of Christ and the Pharisees sort of fighting over the Sabbath here in Luke 13, 14 through 16. And this does take place on the Sabbath. But the synagogue official, indignant because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath, keep in mind this is the woman who was bent over and, and Jesus cast out a demon to heal her, Indignant because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath, began saying to the crowd in response, There are six days in which to work should be done. 
So come during them and be healed, and not on the Sabbath day. But the Lord answered him and said, You hypocrites, does not each of you on the Sabbath untie his ox or his donkey from the stall and lead him away to water him? And this woman, a daughter of Abraham as she is, whom Satan has bound for eighteen long years, should she not have been released from this bond on the Sabbath day? This is one of the only stories, in fact, it may be the only story, I couldn't find another one where this is the case, where afterward, it says that Jesus had humiliated them. Which indicates to me that after hearing Jesus' response to the synagogue official, even they felt shame. Even these people that looked for every opportunity to undermine Christ, to undermine His followers, to undermine His message, that when they heard this, even they said, you know what, we messed up here. And the point that Christ is making is that you're willing, because one of your animals is thirsty, to do a little bit of labor on the Sabbath to carry him to water. And this woman, who has been sick for 18 years, comes on the Sabbath day to find refreshment and healing from God. And you're upset about it. I think that he had really pricked them in their hearts this time. He really hit them where it hurt. Because even they understood our priorities are wrong. The way that we have been teaching people, the way that we have been so draconian in trying to tell people that these are the things that you can't do on the Sabbath, it's gotten out of hand. It's gotten out of control. That we have been so focused on this that we are not even able to rejoice with this woman who has found healing from God after being bound for 18 long years. Unfortunately, their compassion was not what it should have been. And so, Christ gave this woman who has really been unable to fully rest, been unable to fully relax for 18 years, this wonderful gift on the Sabbath day. A day to do God's work. A day to do good. And that others are supposed to come to God to find relief and refreshment. And Christ, following the example of His Father, did exactly that. He helped her find the relief and the rest that God promises to those who believe in Him. And so, once again, we see Christ doing exactly what His Father did because He learned from Him. Let's look at Matthew 23, 1-4. Then Jesus spoke to the crowds and His disciples, saying, The scribes and the Pharisees have seated themselves at the chair of Moses. Therefore, all that they tell you, do and observe, but do not according to their deeds. For they say things and do not do them. They tie up heavy burdens and lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves are unwilling to move them with so much as a finger. The Pharisees had tied these heavy burdens around these people. Think about this. The Sabbath day. The day of rest. The day that God had ordained for everybody to find relief, to refocus themselves, to focus on God and spirituality. The Pharisees had created all these rules that made it the most stressful day of the week. The day that everybody was supposed to be focused on God and spirituality, they can't do anything because they're afraid if they put one toe out of place, the Pharisees are going to come down on them. They made it more stressful than the six days of labor. And so, whether we're talking about any part of God's law, I think it's important for us to also remember the spirit of the law. Now, the Pharisees had made a whole bunch of other ordinances and a whole bunch of other standards that were not in the law of Moses, that they made of themselves, that they just kind of created. But even when we're dealing with the Scripture, I think that it's very important for us to always remember what is the purpose of God telling us to do this? And be very, very pointed on doing that. Because that's where the Pharisees really messed up here. 
Let's look at Luke 9, 10 through 11. When the apostles returned, they gave an account to him of all they had done, taking them with him. He withdrew by himself to a city called Bethsaida, but the crowds were aware of, his, of this and followed him. And welcoming them, he began speaking to them about the kingdom of God and curing those who had need of his healing. So here we have an episode of Christ wanting to get away, wanting to have a little time to himself, wanting to have some rest, when his apostles come back to him. So they go off to kind of, you know, be by themselves and, and refresh a little bit. But the crowds followed him. And so how did Christ react to this? By doing what we would expect of him. He cured them. He taught them. And if you read a few verses later, he also fed them. This is right before the feeding of the 5,000. And this story takes on even more meaning when you understand the context. Why were the apostles away? Why does it say the apostles returned? Because if you look just a verse earlier, John the Baptist has just been beheaded. That's where his apostles were. They came back to tell Christ, your cousin, whom you love and have known your entire life, has been killed for following God. Don't you think Christ was a little distressed? I mean, this is a point in Christ's life where he is probably pretty drained. And I'm talking physically, spiritually, emotionally, in any way that you can imagine it, Christ is fatigued. He needs a rest. Yes, he's God, but he's also in human form right now and he feels... Emotional distress, he feels physical fatigue, he's probably hungry and sleepy himself, he's already been with the crowds all this time, and then the crowds find out, oh, he's trying to get away, he's headed over this direction, let's follow it. And Christ, instead of saying, you know what guys, I just can't deal with this, throwing up his hands, walking away, I really need a rest, Christ does the exact opposite. He says, come on, I'll heal you. I'll feed you. I'll take care of you. You see, as great as rest is, and as much as God wants us to rest, we can't let it be an excuse to not do His work. That when we see somebody in need, that when we see somebody that needs our help, that still takes precedent. That's something that Christ understood. And He modeled it. You see, when He was criticizing the Pharisees earlier about not obeying the spirit of the law, not trying to do what God asked them to do, taking the legalistic approach and, and trying to play games with God's word, that wasn't just talk. He practiced it. And we see it modeled in this story right here. Now, finally, he does get away. He is able to take a rest. And we'll see what that looked like in Luke, 19 through eight, uh, Luke 9, 18. And it happened that while he was praying alone, the disciples were with him. And he questioned them, saying, who do the people say that I am? Now I want you to think back to the beginning of this lesson. Where we talked about rest being something that is strategic and done with a certain level of self-awareness and self-reflection. This was the rest that Christ finally was able to do right after the feeding of the 5,000 and the crowds went away and he did have a little time to himself. What did that rest look like? He and his small circle of friends got together and prayed and talked about where they were in their mission. It's very important that God is a part of going out into the world, interacting with people. It's very important that God is a part of us serving other human beings. Of course, when we're doing God's work, that God has to be the focus of it. He has to be a big part of that. But the lesson that I think we can take away from this is that God also needs to be a part of our leisure time, too. God needs to be a part of our rest. It's all well and good for God to be a part of us going out in the world, spreading the gospel, doing good work. Of course God is a part of that. Most of the Bible is dedicated to telling us how to do that. But it's also important for us to remember that when we do that and when we go out into the world, when we do decide, okay, it's time to take a rest, that God needs to be at the center of that as well. That when Jesus had a, a few precious minutes to, to steal away and to be with just him and his disciples 
and take a break from healing people, take a break from preaching God's word and spreading the message that the, the kingdom has come, salvation is at hand, that they sat down and they said, okay, what are the people saying about me? How are they receiving this message? What can we do to make sure more people hear this message and hear what God has for them? So Jesus did exactly what we were talking about earlier, exactly what the Sabbath was always intended to be. To take time to recenter themselves and to spiritually align themselves with God. And even Christ, who was perfect, had no sin, even he took that time to do some self-reflection. I think that there's a powerful example to be had there. That whenever we decide that we need a break, whenever we have become weary and we're exhausted and we need to take some time to really refocus ourselves spiritually, then it needs to be done one of two ways. Either praying, reading scripture, just us, just some time one-on-one -on -one with God, which we also see in the gospel that Christ did. That, that was also a common occurrence. That There were times, uh, for example, right before he walked on water, where he was alone and not even the apostles were with him, and that was something that Jesus obviously felt was, was beneficial for him as well. Or, Maybe we get together with a small group of friends. Maybe we get together with them and, and try to have our brothers and sisters in Christ encourage us and we sit down and talk, have a conversation, talk about, okay, where are we and how can we improve ourselves? How can we do a better job of the mission that God has given us? How do we do a better job of adhering to the principles in the Scripture? You see, I think once we have changed our perspective, have changed the way that we look at the time that we have. When we start seeing it as a blessing, and we start seeing it as something that God has given to us and God rightfully owns it, and that any time we have to ourselves ought to be used then to be able to recenter ourselves, then our goals change a little bit. And that we realize that when we do finally take a rest, it's not so we can just sit around and veg out, or do nothing. It's supposed to be something that we use, always looking toward being able to better achieve the goals that God has set for us. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. There are actually quite a few biblical stories about people that really needed to rest. And I think there is none more prominent than we'll find in 1 Kings chapter 19, verses 4 through 7. And to understand what has just happened in this story, we join the prophet Elijah after he has just been through this ordeal at Mount Carmel. These prophets of all these paganistic gods have stood there and tried to get Baal to light up the altar to consume this sacrifice. And Elijah has just proven what frauds they are. There have been people with Israel that have risen up with him to stand with him after seeing this great miracle, stood against Jezebel, stood against Ahab. And finally, Elijah is seeing all these people, the winds of change have kind of turned his way. He's on this great spiritual high. And then immediately afterwards, we're, we're talking probably minutes to hours, not even a full day. We find Elijah having to flee for his life. He's just been through this great thing, done all this amazing work for God. And then once again, after all that, it seems to have done no good. That Elijah is having to run for his life simply by speaking the truth that God tells him to. And so now Elijah is exhausted. And he's not just exhausted because he's had a long day. He is exhausted because of what has happened for months and years at this point. It seems like no matter what he does, he doesn't make any headway. He keeps doing exactly what God tells him to do. He's abstaining from sin. He's preaching the truth. 
He even had some success that we just saw at Mount Carmel. And yet, Ahab and Jezebel, still in power. And no matter what he does, he feels like he can't do anything right. Because even when he does everything that God tells him to do, the guy is still on the run for his life constantly. And so finally, Elijah is fed up. This is somebody in desperate need of rest. And see, so he flees to Horeb. He's by himself, in hiding. And he finally has this conversation with God in 1 Kings 19, 4-7. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a juniper tree. And he requested for himself that he might die and said, It is enough now, O Lord. Take my life. For I am not better than my father's. He lay down and slept under a juniper tree. And behold, there was an angel touching him, and he said to him, Arise and eat. Then he looked, and behold, there was at his head a bread cake baked on, a hot, sto on hot stones and a jar of water. So he ate and drank and lay down again. The angel of the Lord came again a second time and touched him and said, Arise, eat, because the journey is too great for you. Now this is an interesting response, isn't it? There's some episodes in the Bible where you look at God's behavior and you're like, yeah, that analogy of him talking to us like a father really makes sense here. Because here's Elijah, who is understandably very distraught. And he basically throws a temper tantrum and, and gets pretty dramatic. And God's response is basically, look, you're tired, you're hungry, take a nap, eat some breakfast, then we'll talk. Don't we have faith that God knows what we need? There are times where we do need rest. There are times where maybe all we need is a meal. And there are times that we need those things to be able to continue to do God's work. But God knows what we need. We see in the scripture that he knows what we need even before we, we request it. So Elijah that is so upset, so angry, that he is literally begging God to kill him because he doesn't want to have to continue with this. The man is ready to go home and be with his father. And God's response to this, very mature, very father-like, hang on, get a little rest, I'll give you some food, you'll feel better. And once that takes place, once that has happened, then we know that Elijah does go on to be very successful. But sometimes, rest is an act of faith. The reason that the Sabbath is designed the way it is, the reason that God gave them a day a week and then a year every seven years that they were supposed to not labor is because they were supposed to have faith that God was going to provide for them. The reason that in the wilderness... He gave a double portion on Friday for them to gather so that they wouldn't gather on the next day. The children of Israel had to have faith that God knew what they needed and that he was going to provide what they needed. That he was going to give them enough to get through that day without having to labor. We need to do exactly the same thing. Whenever we're tired, we're distressed, we feel like we can't go on, sometimes the best thing that we can do is to take a step back, go off by ourselves, and start talking to God. Now sometimes God may have to, to take a few minutes before he's ready to respond, just like he did with Elijah. But the point is, he's already there. He knows what we need. And just like any good father, he knows exactly the right way to respond to us personally and give us exactly what we need in order to carry out the task that he has given to us. Now if you in your own life have fallen short in this endeavor, if you haven't necessarily always been the good soldier, and just like all the rest of us, sometimes you get tired of what's going on and that's led you astray, then we would be more than happy to pray with you to help get you back on the right path. Or maybe you haven't started that journey at all, and you need to be baptized in loving obedience tonight. If you have any of those needs, please let us be known now while together we stand and sing.